Well, an exciting day ahead, sweltering here in the uh, in the cabin. Um, uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, a conversation that will have equal heat to it, I imagine, because uh, I'm joined by uh, good friends, um, uh, a returning guest and a debutant. So I have Will Roberts, who's been on before, and uh, we've got lots to talk about. And I'm delighted to welcome Kirsten Wing to the podcast. Kirsten, uh, let me firstly welcome you and uh, invite you to tell me all about yourself and uh, and and what you why you're even in coming here to have a conversation with me today. Hi, Stu. Thanks. Um, well, that's a tough question to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, my name's Kirsten. I'm originally South African. I migrated to to Mud Island to continue my studies some <laughs> seven, eight years ago. Um, and the weather today, thankfully, has has followed us across the pond. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Gloucestershire, um, and I work closely with Will Roberts, which is why um, Will is going to be uh, on the podcast with us today as well. Um, like another professor called Mark de St. Croix and then Colin Baker. So they're my supervisory team. And basically I was brought in um, as a pracademic, as someone who's really passionate about pediatrics. So youth, youth injury, uh, movement, coach education. Um, I was brought in to evaluate the Boeing program, which is a program I know that you've spoken about before and I'm sure we'll recap. So I think that's me in a nutshell. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. And Will, welcome back. A reminder for the audience who may have not heard the excellent episode, which I highly recommend going back into the back catalogue for. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, But welcome back. And uh, yes, just a quick recap of you and all things all things you do. Thanks, Stu. Nice to be back. Um, Thanks for having us. I, I yeah. So since the last one, which was sort of, I think, four years ago, something like that, maybe. Um. <laughs> I'm now a senior lecturer in sport development and coaching at the University of Waikato in New Zealand, um, involved in the, the Boeing project with some excellent colleagues, Danny Newcomb, Sean Longhurst, um, Doug Struthers, Kit Cutter, Ben Franks, others that, that sort of have been in conversations with you at different points as well. So that's part of what I do. And then, yeah, very, very fortunate to be part of the Children's Coaching Collaborative that, that's a sort of collaborative amongst a number of organisations looking at how we support and, and uh, develop the workforce with a mind to supporting young people's movement and, and enjoyment of sport and physical activity. So yeah, a bit, a bit about me, um, uh, but all of it collaborative and, and with brilliant people. So I'm basically hanging on the coattails as I will of Kirsten today. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so uh, where to start really, I guess, um, what might be useful actually uh actually i might come to you first here will um i know you have we have spoken about boeing in the past because you've been on with danny's talk about it but again like i think the concept of boeing and and where it's rooted both i guess practically and theoretically uh it would be worth worthwhile kind of just talking that through and then that will act i think as a useful segue to talk about the research that kirsten's been involved with because i think there's some really exciting findings that it's worth talking about so um yeah over to you okay <laughs> thanks mate <laughs> um I, I'll, I'll try and coherently do an abridged version um but fundamentally uh, Dan, i worked with danny uh, newcomb at oxford brooks university we were both with with a number of other great colleagues on the um sport coaching and PE degree there and we would wax lyrical about constraints based approaches to coaching and how that would be a useful way to do things and, and I'll sort of come back to that in a moment um, yeah, and uh, at the time we were working with a number of students one of whom I distinctly remember sort of saying you know oh, go, go on then show us what it looks like uh, and we at the same time were approached by a number of schools in the Oxford area sort of asking for a bit of help with their PE curriculum. So Boeing was a kind of initial response to us trying to do a number of things theoretically with our students and being challenged to do something practically. And so we we sort of set about with with Doug Struthers and and, uh, others, um, Sean Longhurst, Danny and myself in the early parts to try and design 
at the time a curriculum for physical education that, that might be based on a constraints sort of led approach to coaching um and that's just, that was the sort of initial genesis of it we we started to do that curriculum we ended up with 120 games that, that are sort of loosely based on a number of the key points of of the national curriculum at, at primary age it's evolved since then um we found that that that's quite a difficult um space to work in we we're coaches you know we don't want to tell teachers what to do but there were some nice ideas and so we sort of we sort of migrated into coaching volunteering anyone working with young people of that age really and that that's sort of the journey that we then started on with some funding from sport england was to look at how we might support coaches teachers volunteers to really get their heads around the philosophical ideas rather than just hand over a curriculum like that's not the answer to to developing good practice in in, in physical activity settings is to to give an off-the-shelf curriculum but actually to work with practitioners to to sort of develop their understanding um and and that's sort of the point at which kirsten will enter the fray uh in in terms of trying to you know so what we did then was design a workshop some series of educational um uh resources to support coaches volunteers practitioners uh, and Kirsten's PhD, which I'm sure we'll talk a, a fair amount about, was to sort of look at the efficacy of that that training and that support and, and what we might learn from trying to, to sort of uh, invest in the workforce in a way that isn't just give you a, a, a curriculum that, that might solve some issues. And, and just to backpedal and, and do a little bit about the constraints led approach, we were really clear i guess that we wanted to make sure this wasn't sport because that can be quite off-putting to lots of people or quite scary that it was really around movement and play and that, that's important for us and the constraints led approach uh, is, is where a lot of my research i guess is is founded um, looking at how we might design environments design playful environments that lead to decisions to movement to expression to to an enjoyment of moving that isn't based on a technical sports model but is very much based on an exploration of of interacting with obstacles with others with the environment and and we just felt that having a, a really solid theoretical underpinning would would give us a better opportunity to support coaches volunteers teachers because then you can actually talk to them about a philosophical and a theoretical underpinning that they can then run with on their own. And it isn't just, oh, there's a game. It's genuinely understanding why might I do this game and what might I tweak and, and develop and increase the challenge, lower the challenge to make sure that different individuals can access those games in, in different ways. And, and, um, yeah, hopefully that gives a bit of an overview. Um, yeah, and, and coherent just, enough. Just to, I guess, probe there a little more. Um, the 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 part of the reason I think you maybe got a bit of um, challenge when it came to the sort of education space, I think, um, was because obviously the the approach to or the the approach that you would adopt around the creation of an environment and and the development of an environment which is sort of exploratory and allows an, a young person to sort of develop movement competencies according to their own physical makeup but also as a response to a environmental stimulus through a game or a task um, is sort of almost anathema to the way the traditional education model works um, and so, of course, that was, I mean, I think you've got some really passionate advocates amongst some of the schools that you're working with, but scale and reach was challenging because of some of the resistance you got uh, in the outset, hence the, the desire to pivot. But I wonder if I can sort of just invite you to I maybe, you know, and then you can be as, as reflective or as honest as you like about, you know, that kind of challenge and the dynamics of the sort of presentation of this non-linear conceptualization of movement development and how almost counterintuitive it is for people and hard for them to sort of map onto yeah thanks thanks for that <laughs> um there's so th i think there's a number of layers to that 
and um, I'll answer them honestly and hopefully with a bit of humility as well. So I think if I roll back to who I was and probably who Danny was five, eight years, well, eight years ago when we designed this, I guess, um, it's like, you know, well, we've, we've cracked this, we've, we've solved this, uh, it's chaotic learning, this is going to be great. Um, we do it in our coaching, so, you know, it, it's, it makes sense to do it in teaching. Here you go, here's these ideas. And, you know, in a very sort of naive and uh, uh, academically immature way that for the two of us at the time, um, that can be quite hard to sort of access and, and work out how you, you might use that in your own setting. And I think as we've sort of matured and, and as Boeing has matured in terms of the way that we communicate research and think about that, that uh, will have changed over time. So. Yeah, I think if you sort of go into a setting and say, look, hey, we've got this, we've got this solution to all your problems. Well, hang on, how, how do you know there's a problem here? Oh, well, you know, for, for decades, we've got a decline in physical activity post 16. So we're clearly getting it wrong. Well, that's going to put people off, actually. And we, what we've learned, I guess, as a, as a both an organization, but also um, the sort of academics individually within that is to, to meet people where they're at a bit better to understand what the challenges are. And actually, if I think about the challenges in education, whether it's for me at university or a primary school um, teacher in that setting, there are a number of other people that you have to present to, whether that be parents or an exam board in, in higher education. And so the, the sort of, the way that education is set up at the moment is very much um, lends itself to a, tell me what the learning outcomes are, develop those things, report back on those learning outcomes show that you've moved on it doesn't really lend itself to hey it's going to be really individual could be a bit chaotic you you might not be able to measure it in traditional ways so you're gonna to have to really think about quite fluid and observational modes of assessment like oh gosh that that's that's quite a challenge so i think the sort of setting of of education um and the, the different approach that we were trying to to advocate probably wasn't right and we didn't necessarily have a really um a really sound understanding of the primary school setting i think it's fair to say that none of us were primary school teachers so sort of bowling in with a movement solution is not the same as as sort of bowling in with a and here's how we can help you navigate the educational challenges that, that you might find and actually we we've sort of done some of that around OK, how do you assess this? How do you map that against the curriculum then? How how could you demonstrate development? And, and lots of that work has gone on in the last eight years. So I think in a, in a really different place to go into to schools now and increasingly seeing that um, supporting the workforce, actually, when you're engaged with the workforce, they've got so many of the solutions themselves anyway. Oh, well, we do this in English, so we'll just do this in PE. And it's a it's really around confidence and supporting them to understand that pedagogically that they're, they're experts anyway in in young people, and hit, you know and we can just help you in this PE setting, but bring all your knowledge to bear in in sort of developing young people and supporting young people. Actually, it becomes a much easier conversation. So, pre so I guess shifting so presenting it as the solution towards now as 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 one of a. A, a, a range of approaches that somebody could sort of add to their toolbox so to speak yeah and, and I think that's you know my reflection over the last few years is that 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 is actually really important that you know as long as we've got the sort of young person at the heart of our um, thinking then then we can start to use a range of things that are available rather than just oh we, we must do this thing you know if I if I think of an example something like the daily mile taken out of context is well do do we want people just to do that or do we want them to enjoy and but actually if if that is a part of what is a, a wider curriculum um you know and i'm not trying to um i certainly not trying to say anything derogatory about the daily mile but i think some people have jumped on the, on that on the back of things like that interventions like that or interventions like boeing and said oh well, you can't just do that it's too chaotic or you can't do that it's too regimented yeah, but if that is part of a, a wider curriculum with the child at, at heart, actually, they, they do need to do that because maybe it's some calm time and it allows them to socialise with others. And, and actually, th that becomes part of a really rich and meaningful curriculum that's quite diverse that then 
you know, in different ways can can really tap into the knowledge, confidence, attitude of young people towards physical activity. It's when those things are done in isolation without intention, w- without much sort of thought that, that they can be less purposeful, less, less powerful. So, I, and I think that's sort of where I think we need to move gen- generally in the workforce is not towards silver bullets, but towards a well-intentioned, wide and varied sort of uh, experience for young people in physical activity. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. And sometimes, uh, you know, it made me reflect a little bit sometimes on, um, you know, I, I obviously am a passionate advocate for non-linear, constraints-led, ecologically driven or, you know, um, approaches partly because I just see great promise in them and they've been transformative for me in terms of my practice. But I recognize as well that it's not, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, and, and likewise, I mean, like my view is, is that the problem we often have is that, that there is only really kind of like one offer to practitioners in terms of the kind of theoretical basis around you, how, how they might go about things. So I like, I do passionately believe in presenting the alternative. I think in time people begin to realize that you know one has greater strengths than the other and then they might start to make more more informed choice about the way, the way they go and do things um but it's just not being presented with the offer so this you know as a as a as a method say in the education context so yes yes you can do it this way with the learning outcomes and a more sort of linear prescriptive approach but here's another way with equal validity and actually then people can start to make an informed choice quite interesting so Kirsten, yeah. you're, you're, oh, sorry, go on. Go on I was, I was just going to say, sorry, and, and then, like, you know, it's over to Kirsten because she's done all the real work, is, um, you know, we were talking off air, there's, there's a sort of sense, you know, it's quite easy to judge how I coached 15 years ago would not be how I coach now sort of thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to this, um, this idea, I was watching some coaching that, that was in a sort of uh, performance context with no opposition and I'm there thinking oh no you know it's not constraints where's the opposition you need decisions and and I've made this judgment and I, I walk over you know I have a chat to the coach oh you know you know what about a game what about some opposition actually that young person doesn't have very much confidence so I've given them the space to explore without the difficulty of a of a defender there because I know they'll you know I've done this for the last few weeks and they'll fail and, and I'm on my back heels thinking actually there's a really well-intentioned decision there and then we had a chat about okay how might we do that differently and what could that look like and I I think that's for me it's those conversations and meeting practitioners where they're at and trying to understand that that context and then supporting them to like as you've said look here is a really valid alternative and it might look like this and we could do that and I think those conversations have have sort of helped us kind of progress things and I know um Kirsten in her research will have been having those sorts of conversations with with coaches and and that's the key bit I think is the messaging and and thinking through how we support those that have to do it day in day out is is something that's uh, part of this and not just throwing sort of theoretical and conceptual answers at people or here's the curriculum we've solved it for you no like it it just doesn't work you can't do that yeah totally get that totally get that so of course um Kirsten, you're the, you're the one with the um, unenviable task, or enviable, I don't know, uh, of trying to make sense of all of this. Um, and so I don't even know where to start, but I imagine from our, our opening kind of preamble, you've probably got some thoughts that you want to throw in, and then we can jump into the sort of findings that you've got. Um, as you've probably gathered from the conversation thus far through the podcast, it's, it's a notoriously complex area um and it's intricate and it's beautiful in a lot of senses and I think when a researcher tries to come in and explore something that is so innately complex and multifaceted we often lose some of the integrity and um some of the beauty in it actually because we try and reduce it down to its component parts and we can research it and find out what's going on and I think you can't really do that with something like with like physical literacy in and around coach education and young people because it is it's chaotic it's dynamic and it's exciting 
which means that the research might look a little different to research maybe in other areas, which is maybe where I come in and maybe why Will some three years ago now decided to take a chance on on, on letting me do the research. Um, I come from a, a mixed background because I'm not a coach, which might be interesting considering I stand in a room full of coaches investigating a, a coach education um, program. But so I'm a, I'm a sports therapist by trade. So kind of very reductionist, you know, very quantitatively based, almost biomedical. Um, and as a young person working in, in professional sport, I was working with um, pediatrics with youth athletes. I realized that the adherence to our rehab programs was so poor. Um, and it, it's no guess why, it's because they're boring. And you're dealing with, with kids who are kids at the heart of it. I know that they've got professional scholars on them and they're wearing uniform and they look like young men and women, but they're still kids at the end of it. And it got me thinking that there's, there's gotta be a different way to do this. So I ended up doing an SNC masters where I was introduced to things like ecological dynamics, constraint led approaches, learning about motor learning, that there isn't just one way and it doesn't have to be um, schema theory and it doesn't have to be kind of all explicit coaching. And I thought to myself, you know what, this is, this is really fascinating because it's hit home for me. It's made a big difference to the way I work as a therapist, the adherence that I have to programs, making it fun, engaging young people, um, engaging their coaches, because, you know, if you want someone to enjoy what you do and ultimately stick to it, when it comes to something like injury, which is important, injury and rehabilitation, it's really important that you get that right. So that's how I came into it. So I came from an, an appreciation that this is a big construct. There are lots of things going on. It's going to get really messy. But in the messiness is the beauty. Um, and I don't think you can reduce it down and pretend to capture all of it. So the research, like I said, looks a little bit different. It makes use of some novel techniques, which is how the academics like to say novel techniques. It means it's chaos. Um, but we'll talk about that in more detail. But I think that's probably my initial thought was it's going to be different and it's going to look different, but it's also really exciting. So how do you even like begin? I mean, this might be for both of you to talk about because I imagine you've wrestled with this. And it is, I think, a challenge for any researcher working in this space is you're trying to retain the uh, well, you're trying to retain by, by working in an environment that is trying to maintain as as much um, as much of the sort of complex dynamics in place because that's actually the 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 root that drives the movement. But at the same but at the same time, trying to make sense of that, like you say, with all the noise and the chaos, is a real challenge. So, like, how do you even begin to think about doing that? Um, and go on, you go, Kirsten, and then Will can wade in after. Well, the word that keeps coming to my mind, and it's something that um, I'm busy writing the thesis at the moment, is as I constantly ask myself, is is it authentic? Mm. Is it true to the participant? Is it true to the child? So am I honouring the child's voice in the way that they've said something or the way they intended it? And my methods might not be perfect, which I will answer for in my viva, as every candidate does, <laughs> but it makes an attempt to honor the participant and what's going on. I really love the work from a guy called Julian North, who I know is, is, is a very good colleague to both of you, but he talks about events that are observable and events that aren't. My job isn't to investigate what I can't see. So the underpinning mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So all the theory behind Boeing. So the how of the how of the play, that's not my job. I'm not here to investigate all these wonderful academic theories. I'm investigating what I can see and what those observable events are. Are the kids more active? Are they enjoying it? Are coaches, you know, reporting higher levels of attitude, confidence and knowledge after training? What does that look like? We can then talk about and speculate what happens on a theoretical level. But from a research level, if I focus on what I can see and what I can capture, that is authentic to the environment. And for me, that makes a really big difference when you're taking something that's so wonderfully complex, you don't have to tackle it all. 
you just have to tackle what you can see. Nice. Will? Yeah, so I think um, there's some real merit in, in what Kirsten has just said around what the, I guess what the focus of her research is on. Um, so if I strip back to the, the what we did, if we've taken those concepts, we've designed the curriculum. And as I said, we, we kind of worked out that we needed to meet the practitioners where they were at. And so Danny, Sean, Kit and Ben, and sorry if I'm sort of missing anyone from that, but that they really looked at um, how we support the practitioners. So they set off designing a learning journey that's, that because of COVID ended up being um, a, a virtual interactive learning journey for practitioners. So they have to engage in some questions and, and do some, some work online and watch some of the, the games and the videos. And then they come to a workshop that's that's very interactive and gets them exploring their own understanding of the principles behind Boeing. And that's really where Kirsten's research is trying to, to kind of um, have its laser focus is, you know, not, not do constraints work or don't they work? Um, we, we're doing some of that work in the background, but her work really is focusing, okay, how do we get coaches to a adhere to understand be confident in working with the, those principles around non-linear pedagogy constraints and what does that look like in their practice you know how are they how are they adopting those how are they maintaining those ideas in their their daily practice and that's where we kind of looked at at this so that we retain some of the complexity but of the of the kind of game design without trying to understand that, but trying to understand how the coaches operate with it. And I think that's where the, for me, the interesting work is and, and where it links with the, the children's coaching collaborative work that we're doing is, is really trying to understand how children experience the practice of the coaches ultimately. So we've, we've put them on this workshop, we've supported them, we've developed them. What then does their practice look like and how do children engage with that practice? Like, is it better? Is it worse? Does it help them? And that, that for me, I think is, is the novel piece of, of Kirsten's research is really understanding what coaches do with, the, with the, the knowledge and education they've had and how young people interact with those coaches when they start to, to maybe do things differently or, or, un, or for us to understand why they don't do things differently. And I think that you know, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get to some of the findings that that are coming out of the early work. And I think that's, this is where the big, the challenge is for us is, is to support coaches beyond bite-sized education opportunities, right? And, and that's, that's what we're starting to see is they like these ideas, they see some validity in these ideas, they're engaged in the notion that we might do coaching differently, but then what, you know, like how do we support them? How do we, because it's hard. It's to hard lead, to lead on from what Will's was saying around kind of the ongoing use. Um, the the research project uses a framework to help us make sense of the chaos, if that makes sense. Um, and it's it comes from healthcare originally. It's called the Reaim framework, which I found particularly useful. And if you haven't heard about it, it's it is quite straightforward to use, and it, it talks about reach effectiveness adoption implementation and maintenance so many interventions like Boeing will will hit many of those targets very few interventions will do the RE part and continue to do the adoption implementation and maintenance part so the maintenance is the last category that comes um, in that framework and that's where things start to get tricky because it's not just oh did it work short term did it work long term and did it evolve? And that is, I think, the key that so many people are trying to find is, is can it continue? Can it evolve? Can it grow? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember the, the re-aim and I was going to, I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to ask about it. So if you are talking about, you, I really like it as a framework, actually, and almost like as, as a framework for the design of any kind of, people development intervention in many ways um but i wanted to just ask about it because like the reach element i'm what, what how do how do you conceptualize the reach element 
that that's the interesting bit for me and then we can drill into the other bits so it's all about access mm. so reach is about how do i reach the targeted population so the targeted population for boeing believe it or not is so unbelievably widespread that it makes researching it a bit of a nightmare because you've got so many wonderful diverse people you've got teachers coaches coach educators volunteers community workers it can basically be anybody who's working with young people getting access to certain groups we know is going to be incredibly challenging and that's why this project is so unique because it works with partnerships that are already established in industry so as a researcher i'm not actively recruiting a particular demographic i'm actually recruiting the people it's already working with again coming back to that word authentic it's the people that are actually in, interested and in actually you know working in the area on the ground with the kids that you know might need this kind of intervention to be exposed to um I like that. And so if I'm right, re-aim, there's like a colon between the re and the aim. Um, and that's because reach and effectiveness is defined by adoption, implementation and maintenance. Am I right or have I got that wrong? So it can work both ways. OK. So generally, um, how it's been used in academia recently is, is, is the RE is kind of the design part. Mm -hmm. So who are we going to target um, and how do we know that it's going to be effective? Now, that can be based on lots of information, lots of reading, kind of previous studies. But our target population for this intervention ultimately is the kiddos. because It's all about the kiddos. But we've got to go through practitioners to get there. So our targeted population is the practitioner. We know that practitioner education is fairly effective, and we've proven that in the first part of this thesis, online workshops work. We know it. We know they do. But then you've got to move into adoption, implementation and maintenance, and that's more around how do I help the organization utilize the resource in a way that works for them? How do I ensure it's used properly so it's implemented in the way that it was intended to? Um, and how do I um support long-term redelivery and retraining so the maintenance aspect how do i top up that knowledge and it will look different for every organization maintenance looks so different for whichever group so for example if you're dealing with a group of coaches working in a particular environment it's going to look vastly different to those who are working in a community setting and that's where it starts to get really fascinating and really interesting because the children are different and the practitioners are different so it's bringing together such a wide group um, of people and kiddos um, and it's going to look so unique on every level which mm. as a researcher makes it so fascinating because you're never going to reach one conclusive answer so you but uh, but broadly speaking you said something quite interesting there which is in itself probably worthy of conversation Online learning works. <laughs> so how do we, how do we, I might be jumping ahead too far. We might need to get to some else, but how do we get to that conclusion? Like what, what how were you able to, def, to, um, to kind of make that point? Because the reason I asked the question, the reason it's interesting is as somebody who's worked in workforce development forever, there's something that I refer to as the hard problem of researching workforce development, which is, creating the causal link between an intervention and a change of behavior that you hope is going to be transformative and sometimes it's very well it's very difficult sometimes to make that link but but we here or i say we you have managed to get something or or to be able to make that kind of statement and i know you wouldn't have made that statement without thinking it through so tell me how we can come to that conclusion as many um, PhDs are structured, you kind of have a couple of different studies within your PhD. Um, so my first one was around um, looking at knowledge gain and confidence gain and attitude in practitioners. So that's the pre. Um, it then looks at changes in those same characteristics directly after the workshop. So it's a pre or post, really straightforward, really simple. Now I must reiterate, it's perceived knowledge. I don't come in and evaluate the practitioner's knowledge. It's how they perceive their knowledge, confidence and attitude to be. Now, that first study comprised of almost a thousand um, individuals who went on the Boeing program. 
and they completed a pre-workshop survey and a post-workshop survey. Now, we did this before COVID in person and we did it during COVID lockdowns online. So our delivery moved online. There is no statistical relationships evident in the, in the data that would indicate that the online workshops are less effective than the in-person workshops. So there is no correlation indicated between those two data sets. So we're seeing the same changes in the online workshops than we are in the in-person workshops. That might surprise many people because a lot of us have traditionally enjoyed uh, running around the indoor hall, playing the games ourselves, <laughs> learning it from that perspective. But as one of my participants so eloquently said in an interview, um, and they're happy for me to share the quotes of that, was that doing it online removes so many more barriers because if we're trying to access people who aren't sporty, who don't wanna engage in this, we need to consider some of the barriers that they face. So she said it actually was a facilitator for her being online because she didn't have to worry about running an indoor hall. She didn't have to worry about those kind of constraints, which for her terrified her. So we wouldn't have had the engagement before. Meanwhile, online we do. So the statistics that we've got, so it was kind of quantitatively based, sorry for the qual people in the room. It does get qual later, I promise, but it starts off with quant. So just looking at pre post, we're seeing massive changes in knowledge, confidence and attitude pre and post workshop. So we know we know it is working. We also know that it's also being retained. So there's a, there is a drop off about 20% across all of those characteristics, but we also know it's higher than the pre-workshop training values. So we know it works because the participants are telling us that it works. Okay, so that's interesting um, because you know, famously, people talk about the, I think it's the ebbing house forgetting curve, isn't it? That, you know, you lose about 90% of the information, but you booked that trend, it seems. Well, I certainly haven't, but it seems like <laughs> our, our UK workforce has. Now, <laughs> I think I think it's it's about retaining the key pieces of information. We're all going to interpret and retain different key nuggets from learning. Um, I'm sure if you ask all three of us what our highlight was from the podcast at the end, we'd probably say different things, but we've all taken something away. Mm. Now, as long as that something is useful in delivery and is bound and is founded on what Bo Boeing calls its six C's. So I'll let Will explain that in a, in a second, but those are the key aspects of Boeing. Those are the key components of Boeing. And many people are walking away with those and then using them. So again, the implementation maintenance is going to look very different depending on what hits home with those individuals. But what they're telling us is six months after, they're in a better place than they were before to use, play, and non kind of constraint led approaches in their delivery settings. It's interesting. I mean, I. I know I was one of your subjects uh, in a face-to-face -face context, and I still remember, I take away quite a lot of things, but there was one thing that I distinctly remember, which is the opening warm-up game, which was the no-ball game, which is brilliant because it's just a way of people getting to know each other and getting to know each other's names, which is quite a, quite a fascinating, and I still use it today. So there's, so if, there's, if, there's, if, if you're using an N equals one <laughs> anecdotal story of, of its success, I would, I would entirely concur. Um, so, um, uh, Will, Kirsten's just brilliantly thrown you under the bus and sent you scrambling to find the six Cs. <laughs> so tell us more. Oh, literally, literally. <laughs> I, this is where I need Sean for things like this. Um, <laughs> his, his retention of knowledge is insane. So, look, I think there's a note of caution, though, to what, what we've just kind of talked about, what Kirsten's just talked about, as well as some really nice uh, ideas going forward. And, and this, is, this is about sort of meeting people where they're at, right? And so what, what we found is that in some workshops, you know, I, the, the one, for example, that, you know, was largely um, focused on hockey practitioners was face-to-face. -face. It's great. There's lots of people that are quite confident and active and that works but as Kirsten's just described there are people that you know have got different barriers maybe they've got children of their own that they need to pick up from school so going to a workshop at 
six till eight an hour away from home is just not something you can do so you're not accessing education and and so what some of the learning is around and and uh, how we support the workforce how we put workshops on how we can meet them where they're at and i think a blend of face to face and and online is probably where we need to go but the, those online things are interactive they're not just tick box it can't be watch a video and tell us what you've learned at the end of it you know it needs to be interactive and challenging and, and communicative and collaborative uh, that that's sort of where real opportunities for learning can take place but the note for caution is what we do beyond that because we, we know that you kind of we can learn a few things we can be in a workshop it feels quite nice we can chat to some others if you go back out and you're coaching and there's five or six coaches and you've all been on the workshop then you can continue that conversation but what I think a lot of coaches face is Tuesday night on their own, right? And so who do I talk to? What do I make my coaching look like? So those, those sort of, are, if we go back to our earlier conversation around what were the barriers when you had the education conversations, well, this can look quite chaotic. So if I'm coaching on my own and I'm coaching in a sort of fairly non-linear, chaotic, problem-based way, and I'm on my own and I don't remember what the six C's were, and I'm scrambling for them. And there's a bunch of parents on the sideline expecting what I what they think coaching might look like. Do I do I maintain that practice? And that's where the re-aim stuff is interesting. Or do I revert back to other practices that are culturally resilient? You know, to, to use a phrase that, that, that you've been exploring on a number of podcasts recently. Like it's easy to go back to the thing that we think coaching should look like. And so I think this is my, my note for caution and, and the challenge, I guess, for us all in coach education and coach development moving forward is if we can get some ideas out there for coaches, how do we support them to try those out, to, to be resilient with trying them out, to be innovative in their own way with those principles? You know, I, I think I know what that might look like, but that's resource intensive. It's lots of mentors. It's lots of coach developers. It's a really coherent um online space for them to go and visit uh, and and to be supported and i know there's a number of organizations you know sport england uk coaching governing bodies trying to do those things but we need to do that in a sort of fairly systematic and and coherent and joined up way and that's what we're seeing that drop off whether it's 90 percent or we've been fortunate 20 percent I think over over time really will start to drop off if we're not supported and and back in and and uh, challenging and and helping answer questions and that that for me is where we're starting to see um, some of the interest in work in Kirsten's research is okay what do we do twelve months twenty four months thirty six months down the line after we after we supported coaches um, because it is different we're asking coaches to do it in a different way and it's very child-centered it's very collaborative it's, it's very problem-based there aren't technical models we're adhering to we're looking at exploration of, of movement in complex environments okay that supporting that is can be quite challenging which is what we're finding now so as i mentioned that the most phds are comprised of multiple studies so studies kind of later on so one is looking at kind of knowledge gain does it does does the intervention actually work before you move on to the next stages does it actually have that effectiveness in the re-aim framework um, and then it looks at knowledge retention and then it looks at sharing practice and then the final one looks at the child so the child's experience because at the end of the day it, it's all about them and if if the intervention is well positioned and well intentioned but doesn't reach the child um you know then there's questions to be asked so that's why the phd is kind of so systematic it, it works through does it work is that knowledge being retained is it shared and does it actually get through to the child and what we're finding in the second and third studies is that while there is this uptake the uptake is fairly volatile so things like confidence change quite quickly um, knowledge seems to be retained better and so does attitude but confidence to deliver seems to be quite volatile in comparison to the other two 
coaches are coaches teachers practitioners however whatever term they're working under um appear to be reaching out for kind of ongoing support particularly during something like a covid pandemic um where you know cut teachers coaches practitioners were arguably more isolated than they probably ever have ever been so maybe the barriers were kind of more exposed than they've ever been but they're talking about things like networks using of applications you know um talking sharing practice mentorship there is there is a lot more to be done um and that's not meant to throw a negative spanner in a really positive conversation um it is working and there is good things happening here but but there is a lot more ground to cover. I like um, I like the idea um, uh, that you've sort of exposed there a little bit, which is, and I think this is where quite a lot of evaluation of workforce development, you know, because you're, you're obviously doing this alongside the actual program running. So first and foremost, that's got its own challenges, not least of which going back to the first study, you know, probably originally when you set out to do this, you weren't necessarily thinking that you were going to compare face to face experience with on, an online experience because we were forced online. We wouldn't probably have done it otherwise. So actually, there's an interesting outcome or in, in sort of by, you know, because you wouldn't have been able to do this retrospectively. So by studying alongside, we adapt accordingly and the new finding emerges, which is actually there's no difference between face to face and online. So that debunks the myth that we've got to get everybody in a room traveling hundreds of miles in order to do effective coach education. So we've got past that a little bit. Then we move further into this. And the bit that's different, I think, between what you did, I was excited and why I wanted to talk to you today is because you've gone further because a lot of people stop at the bit that you that you originally talked about, which is, you know, people's confidence, their attitude and their knowledge. And it doesn't surprise me at all that knowledge and attitude are, relatively speaking, more stable than confidence. Um, because, of course, like delivery is contextual. So, you know, you might have an enormous amount of confidence doing something with one particular cohort and then you go to a particular different environment with a different cohort and all of a sudden confidence completely. I've experienced that myself. so I totally resonate with that. Um, but you go further. So you're going further. And this is the bit that's really interesting, which is to say, let's look at the effectiveness of the intervention through the eyes of the child so what are they essentially perceiving and what can we infer from their perceptions that tells us something about the experience from the practitioner so anyway let's just sort of i'm just going to leave that and let you guys just literally riff off that <laughs> um that's a bit it's a big enough statement too um <laughs> I, I think again this is where um the research project becomes alive for me anyway and that might appeal to my own biases like I said at the beginning I think what unites all three people on this call and, and many many others is that we're really passionate about young people um, and it's got to work for for those who it's delivered to because they're the end users they're the ones who the whole project has been designed for it's like Will said it's it's child-centered it's been designed with them in mind so if it doesn't work for them, a bit of a problem. Um, but what the research does is it, it, it looks at kind of the tra traditional methods of, yes, uh, practitioner education is important um, and it needs to be retained. So that training needs to last. Um, and it also needs to be shared amongst practice. Um, and that's, that's how thing, things grow. Otherwise it becomes very siloed. Um, but if you look at the child's voice, we're using something called unfinished stories. So you might not have heard of it. Um, I certainly hadn't until I looked into this area, but it is becoming more prominent. It actually originated from my understanding from the criminology field um, using a non-invasive, non-confrontational way of interviewing young people about traumatic events. Now, it's not being used in that context at all here. Well, I hope not anyway. Um, it's being it's where the child draws an experience in response to a question or a statement and then narrates that drawing process so what we've asked the young people to do here is if their coach practitioner teacher has completed the pre-workshop questionnaire the post-workshop questionnaire 
a six month follow up. So we have our longer term journey and been interviewed a year after training. So there's four data collection points for a practitioner along this journey. Once they've completed that whole journey, we then speak to the child. So we then know that adoption has has taken place. They are implementing it in their practice. So we do want to know what the child thinks of this new way of play, this new way of learning that they've been exposed to. And I think we were all really surprised at what these young learners started to draw in, in, in various ways. Um, so the, the learners that we've spoken to um, thus far um, have drawn a whole range of themes. They've drawn um, collaboration in some senses. So they value people, you know, more than maybe what we expected. So I'm, I'm talking maybe to one, one drawing in particular here where um, a learner drew the family members watching on the side whilst they were playing a sport. And in his narration, it had very little to do about the sport and everything to do about the people on the side. So that was really interesting that there, there seems to be a real value on those that they have around them. Something else that they drew that took us by surprise um, was yes, they seem to enjoy play <laughs> um, very much so, which, okay, not surprising, but they seem to enjoy digital play as much so, if not more so um, prominently in these drawings. So they, they're talking about playing online, talking about playing with friends, but it's never alone. So all the children who've drawn technology have never drawn technology alone. It's always been in combination with something, either some body or another task. Now, I think that's probably reflective of the generation that, that, that we are working with and we will you know, coach in the future. And those who we teach to coach will coach in the future. So I think that's a really interesting topic um, around there seems to be this world of digital play and physical play. I did not expect that to come up when I asked a young learner to draw what play meant to them, particularly in the environments that we're talking about. So where we've collected data, we collect the data where the child is in that session. So we go to the school, we go to the squash court, we go to the rugby pitch, we go to the football pitch, whatever it is, we're actually collecting data in that setting. So it's surprising when they draw something that's so far outside of that setting when you're talking about play. Um, I think Stu will take it from here now. <laughs> Unless you've got something to add to that, Will? I, I would just really, I, I guess, emphasise that, that part of what we wanted to do was understand how young people interact with with a sort of boingy type approach. And and like if you you know this is not some of this is not new if you look at um well actually work that you've done in the past Stu, work that nick levitt has done in his various roles and 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 others where we start to understand what children want from dot 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 whatever sport that might be or whatever setting that might be they, they very rarely put the things that actually have been the focus of our coaching you know like they very rarely put winning technical development you know they often put friendship fun games and those other things become part of what they list as important but so some of this is is no real surprise that young people want connection, they want enjoyment, um, they they value family being present, they value sort of other forms of play, digital play. Like some of those things are, um, they're really interesting, but but they are a reflection of young people in society, I think, and. They're also a reflection of not everyone is involved in physical activity for the reasons that we think they they might be or we we assume or presuppose that they might be. And I think this is one of the challenges for us across the sector. If we think it's, it's a very unique workforce that deals with play, physical activity, physical education. Sometimes just sort of. Um, holiday club type stuff you know i don't want to call it babysitting but but there is some but and and the workforce that deals right through to development for a performance setting and and we've got a a full-time and a volunteer and a part-time and a very professional set of people you know in that workforce mix as well and so we've got all these competing coaching voices but we've also got all these competing child voices and finding a way to support all of those I think is is a 
is the real challenge that I'm starting to see come out of this research, research is we've got lots of different people that we need to service with our approach to physical activity and sport. And that must, no wonder coaches' confidence <laughs> wavers and goes up and down because they, you know, I don't think they work solely in one of the settings. They, they probably work across a myriad of the settings. You know, if you just take the grassroots coach, they've probably got somebody wants to be there because older sister's there. Somebody wants to be there because mum and dad played netball, cricket, football, swimming, whatever it might be. Somebody wants to be there because they want to become an elite athlete. Somebody who just wants to kick around on a Friday afternoon. And they've got to service all those people. And, and so I think this is one of the things that, that might be future research, might be things we start to resolve in terms of practice, is how do we support all of those competing needs and aspirations? And, and you know, can we do that with, you know, back to the old, you know, it needs to be, a, a wide variety of things that we're offering both practitioners and young people. It can't be one size fits all. It needs to be really sensitive and well thought through support. And we're seeing that already in the research. So picking up from Will's point there, you know, from the commission report that was part of this project, you know, more than 65% of all practitioners are coaching multiple age groups. So more than half of the workforce are working across not only age groups, but focuses. So, you know, within that, you've got everything from under sevens all the way to, you know, 17 plus. But you've also got other teachers, coaches, practitioners there. So you've got people who are in dual roles who, as Will has highlighted, will have to accommodate learners who are all motivated by different things and will attend for different reasons and enjoy different different aspects of it so it's a pretty big toolbox um i think is where we're going with this conversation that that people do need to be able to address you know such a diverse group with confidence and and i think um what what i take from some of what you said there around this idea of um I guess it's, uh, I, I don't know how to think about it, but in, in the provision, as, you, as you've said here, and, and in putting this sort of across to people and you are serving to people, the, the, but the big lens through which this, I think where this research comes from is, as we now move towards a space, and I don't know whether this is just led by strategies, but I think it's also a cultural space where I, I sense that the demand for, um sports experiences or physical activity experiences that are somehow different from what's currently provided seems to be increasing and i think the sense i have is that uh practitioners are looking for something different themselves because they feel as if what they've got is too limiting and they look for alternatives. That's certainly been my experience. I'm not sure if that's, and that seems to be what people who engage with me are saying. Um, again, you know, that's not 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 a widespread thing, but there's enough enough inf enough uh, responses for me to sense that. Uh, but it seems also to me that um, there is an increased demand for experiences that are designed with what children want and for that matter, need, at the heart. So the child's voice being very front and centre. And so to, to dwell on a, uh, an element within, you just touched on there, Kirsten, which was the bit that I guess sort of made my eyes light up. So I think there's something really exciting and interesting in what's emerging from your research, because I was watching, a, I was at a big fitness industry trade show event uh, this week, and I was, there, there were various seminars being run. Um, it was kind of weird, actually, because you're in this seminar, uh, and you've got the noise of a big trade show going on, and then you've got people talking, but everyone's wearing headphones like a, you know, one of those silent discos so that you can hear what's being said. It's quite cool. Um, so um, I, uh, 
in that trade show event, there was a discussion about technology and about the digital space and about how, you know, it's perceived as a threat to physical activity because children are becoming more and more sedentary and spending more and more time indoors in the screen in screens than they are externally. So so often the argument is presented as a it's physical activity against technology you know so it's like a we, you know we 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 are the answer to the fact that these children are spending all this time in a virtual space whereas i think what your research is at least suggesting is that actually that way of thinking we have to challenge because these digital natives are you know the virtual and the physical are a normal part of their life and that they don't really see a distinction between the two clearly in the in, in what they're showing that they, they actually you know the physical and the virtual are kind of synonymous so actually in the design of experiences we probably need to be thinking about baking in the digital so that the two sort of blend and you know home and home and outside or are, are the same and then there's another thought for me as well and this is where i think the constraints comes in and it actually links to the six C's that you talked about earlier on, you know, so these are the kind of boingy principles, aren't they, about it being captivating, challenging, constant play, collaboration, creative and celebrating being unique. So those six C's, those dynamics, in my mind, offer a bit of a framework around experience design. And, you know, I could probably see that, you know, if you were uh, a video games designing company, you'd probably have those six C's as being central to your design philosophy. So actually, to think like a digital video game designer, and there's some interesting research in that space, and also think about like creating a natural kind of bridge or connectivity between the physical and the virtual probably has to be more central in our thinking around physical activity provision for young people going forward. Look, I think it's a it's a very um, interesting area that's probably going to develop quite quickly, whether we're on board with it or, or not. <laughs> um, I certainly don't have the answers. It's certainly not my area um, of knowledge yet. <laughs> um, it's certainly been exposed um, to some degree by this research. Uh, it might be, you know, for another candidate to to really jump on and investigate and run with it. Um, unfortunately, it is it is going quite a lot outside the scope of of where I want to focus. But it is something that they are saying, and I do think that if we want to progress moving forward with the child at the centre of what we do, and if that is really genuinely the focus for for a lot of policy moving forward, I do think we need to listen, and I do think we need to listen actively. So if they are saying. Um, that there is this synergy between digital and physical play, there does need to be a solution to incorporating that or defining that um, or exploring it. Like I said, I have no idea what that looks like yet. Um, I, we stumbled upon this almost um, by accident about what five months ago doing the research. I certainly haven't necessarily seen it kind of as starkly drawn as this elsewhere so it is interesting it is exciting um i know will will probably have um you know more insight on this because I, I, although i work with pediatrics and i love them to bits i don't live with them i think will will have a more well-rounded opinion on this uh, i think i think you've sidestepped what <clears throat> what was a, a challenging question quite well there look i, I i'm not going to weigh into the um well, I am, but uh, there are better people looking at sort of game design and, and digital and, and some of those great folk have been on your your podcast as well, I think. So I don't want to step all over their research and pretend to know everything about th this particular area. But I think as a coach, as a parent, as someone that's sort of interested in game design in my own um, coaching, uh, I think it would be remiss of us just to sort of suggest that we have to completely get children away from the digital you know they're just very different human beings than we were growing up the society they're growing up in is very different you know i as a i i, I was out all the time playing and moving and running and 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 we live in 
a, a different environment and different pockets of our society don't have the access to do that sort of thing. You know, I'm thinking of friends who lived in inner city uh, areas during COVID that, that couldn't get out and be active and move. They're in a flat and they were locked in, locked, uh, locked down and had to stay. So, so we need to start to appreciate different uh, motivations, different access to physical activity. And I think digital is going to and has a role to play in supporting different pockets of people being active. So that, that's one consideration. There is some of this research being done in, in adult spaces. So um, interestingly enough, before coming on, on this, uh, um, an ex-student of ours, a guy called Jack Reed, who's doing his doctoral work at Edinburgh, has, has done some research around sort of online cycling and running spaces and, and looking at um, the sort of digital and, and the real worlds merging there. You know, if you think of things like Strava and I don't, I, you know, I don't want to, or Zwift in terms of cycling, yeah. you know, you've got these spaces that are exploring that, that digital realm and, and the impact that has, you know, and there are, I think, positives and negatives coming out of that research as well in terms of, like, this is a great way for people to be active, but be careful because you're also being, um surveilled in some way you know you have to report your data and, and other people get to compete against you and and some of the work i'm doing in academies that are very digitally driven you know they've got the the data that on on young people um they've got access to digital though we, we're doing some work with the learning lab at, at southampton at the moment around vr and digital and learning so there's no doubt in my mind that those worlds are converging we have to carefully and cautiously plot a way plot a way through that so that it doesn't become gaming and we can still support the active and and i think that the two worlds coming together you know so inviting those that are driving technological advancement and working with with the sort of physical activity coaching sector to work out how can we, we can do that carefully i think is really important um what that looks like at the moment i don't know but I guess what we're seeing, our research suggesting young people are immersed in digital spaces and, and we need to not just tell them they shouldn't. And that, like, that's the parent in me, not the sort of uh, advised uh, intellectual conversation or academic or empirical conversation. It's, you know, I'm, I'm having that challenge at the moment. You, you can't just say, get off your iPad because their mates are on it. And actually there's some social connection and, what if they're the one that doesn't get access to it so that they're excluded from pockets of, of their friends? And but we, I think it's a space that we really need to tread carefully and cautiously through to get it right for young people. Yeah, totally agree. I, I um, And I've, I've spoken about this before, but, you know, it's it's one of the few places because as um, as kind of like child led play, like you said, Will, you know, we we played out. I don't want to. I don't want to age you too much, but, you know, at a time when you only had three channels and therefore going out was, you know, there was, there was nothing on, nothing else to do. So out you go and you go and play and you go and find friends and you make friends and, and all those sorts of things. And that was the way we interacted, but it was very child led. And there was all the, you know, all of the dynamics of that, that is, you know, negotiation and compromise and, um, you know, that, that's the, that, that all that all those dimensions that you get from that but that doesn't necessarily happen as readily anymore so when children are involved in physical activity it's usually adult led and as a result of that sometimes adult designed adult created adult you know so there's not really an opportunity for child's voice to be to be centered in in that in the kind of co-design of experiences so um so the virtual space is one is one of the places where they're free you know, like you say, they can connect with others and they can they can play, but they can play without necessarily the constraints of adults. It's just the constraints of the virtual space that's been created. But there's opportunities to engage in that space. So yeah. it's absolutely no surprise. I completely agree. And there's two things for me that stand out from what you've just said that are really important. Number number one, and this is not in rank order, but number one, I think it's on us to design more appealing spaces for children to to be in because then perhaps they wouldn't be on the digital all the time. Um, and, and, you know, our workforce has changed, right? So both parents, you know, or, or the one parent or who, whatever your family setup is, quite often working, quite often in their own challenging space, maybe don't get to play in the same way that, that um, 
that I, you know, I did, and you, you did uh, age me there, three channels. Um, <laughs> def definitely um, black and white TV. Um, <laughs> you had a titty, mate. <laughs> um, so that, that's one thing, you know, it's on us to, to understand that context and design more appealing spaces. And the other thing is, I think, key, and I, like I love Debbie um, Sayers' work, you know, down at Salisbury Rovers, looking at this sort of thing, is is where is the child's voice in this? It's really important because I'm finding this at the moment. I, I make all the decisions for my kids, all of them. Right, you're going to school at this time. I can drop you off at this time. This is what you're eating tonight. This is what I've got time to cook for you tonight. This is where you're going on the weekend. Like they, they are human beings. So I think the digital space is a space where they get to make decisions and like they, they, they get to plot their way. And so I think some of what we want to do with the Boeing stuff is speak to parents as well. Like how playful is that, that environment? Hey, like how many decisions are they making there? How many decisions do they make at school? You know, we want really creative, innovative people. Great. Sit there. That's your desk. Get in line. Like that, that, that's not creation. That, you know, we're not going to encourage and cultivate creativity if their whole life is spent in a queue or in a line or, or ordered. We can't expect that of young people for them to be both adherent and to be innovative and, and creative. So we've got to think about the things that we're exposing them to in their lives, not just in physical activity. And I think um, th their voice is key in this, hearing them. And sometimes we, we, we might still have to make a decision on their behalf. Do you think that's a good road to cross? Yeah, I'm going. No, you can't. I'm sorry, it's too busy. Right, so we still need to, to support them and be the knowledgeable other and be the older person in the room with experience. But, but I think we need to hear them a bit more in, in physical activity and we need to involve them in decisions a bit more. And then, and then perhaps they'll keep coming back and perhaps they'll find it more fun and perhaps they'll tell their mates and perhaps they'll pick those games up at, at home because, hey, we played this really cool game. That, yeah, and, and I think if you watched young people at play genuine play like and boeing i'd love it to be but it's not genuine play because we're still doing it for them genuine play is emergent it's self-driven it's spontaneous and all the research tells us that if you watch children at genuine play they sort out fun games that have got rules that are fair that change sides because hey we're losing five nil swap the big kid over like they, they do all that without us so we've got to find a way when we do stru structured sport and physical activity to have some of that present because they, they love it when it when it looks like that they're smiley and happy and they love real play so we need to capture some of that i think so if Boeing isn't real, real is it like as in not real play? What do, how do you characterize it? Is it designed play? Yeah, so we we try to capture a number of the things that of real play, right? So, for example, um, one of the things that's really key in the way we design games for us is that they're they're re-emergent. The games they don't stop, so you're not out. There's a way to to sort of re-engage in the game, and, and it can be quite playful there. So you know, we we designed things like that in because um, I think some of the societal constraints that we, we fa we're faced with, whether that's digital, whether that's safety, whether that's more built-up places, more roads, more cars, all those things mean that real play is harder to, to access for lots of people. So I'm I've got no doubt that the physical activity structured opportunity is, is key to young people accessing sport and physical activity. Yes. But that we need to capture some of the essence of real play. And I, I think what that looks like is more of their voice, fewer adult uh, rules, not so much premature professionalization. You know, it's those types of things that, that then cultivate the sort of um, confidence, enjoyment, but, but that we are able then to also support competence because, you know, I, I have this chat with a, with a colleague a lot. If you get better at something, you're going to enjoy it more as well. So this can't just be fun, enjoyment. It, you know, we need to design in a way of allowing them to explore competence and the ability to move effectively and, and merge that with confidence and, and knowledge as well. So, um, oh, look, it's not a really coherent answer, but I think what, what I'm saying is that we try and capture some of the, 
the sort of real emergent self-generating child-driven notions of play if we if we have found that we have to have structured practice opportunities that are structured if we can't just open the doors and say hey go and play at the local field then it's great that we've got a sports club that puts that on but let's at least capture some of the the sort of fun child-centered their voice driven decision making type activity in in that structure where um i say it's to um and and based on what will has said when i when i try and explain this this wonderful concept that you know these people have come up with to to parents or you know interviewees or participants i i explain it a bit like a lasagna <laughs> So it's got all the cheesy goodness that anybody could ever want. You know, it, it looks amazing and you can bet that it tastes great. Child doesn't know that it's got broccoli, peas, carrots, all sorts of stuff hidden in that lasagna. Now, obviously, great time and great care has gone into designing that re recipe to make sure that it's got that nutritional good in it. Now, I'm not trying to pass this on on my own. I've learned from a very educated man that explaining things like a lasagna is a very effective way of explaining boing. So I will credit Danny Newcomb and I'm going to put it in brackets, Newcomb et al, 2019. <laughs> I'm sure he'll love that. Um, but no, but it is quite a nice way of explaining it in the sense that it's got all this nutritional good and people have taken great time and great care to make sure that it is good inside. But to the kid, it still looks like a lasagna. Definitely. Definitely. I, I use the term broccoli burger. Yes. Similar kind of idea. It's got all the nutrition, but it tastes great. So just circling back, uh, Kirsten, because obviously, you know, you, the research and your work is the star of the show here. Um, it, I took us down a bit of a side alley with a digital conversation, but it's, a, it's an interesting area. And, uh, and thank you also for skillfully um, addressing my uh, tendency to take an early an, an early finding and massively overclaim and and want, want to turn it into more than it is. But anyway, nonetheless, it's interesting and I think it was worthy of conversation. But then, the, you know, where you've got to with the research is actually now we're, we're using the child's voice. We're here. We're hearing from children and we're seeing a change in practitioners. And again, I just wonder if you can just expand on that a little bit more, because that's the bit that also is. I, I don't know. I mean, there might be other work out there that's like this, and by, I've not done an exhaustive kind of lit review on this, but it feels to me like it's one of the things within this study that does have a quite an, a, a degree of uniqueness is that, that we've gone like on that journey. Firstly, we've looked at the practitioners, you know, then we've begin to look at the sort of the, the engagement and the, the, the method of delivery. And now we're beginning to see, you know, are children reporting a difference? So over to you look there's no doubt there is a whole range of really um well-reviewed um information on sections of this phd so if you look at coach education you know there's some coach education greats who've who've published lots and likewise with 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 children you know people have done incredible things um kind of valuing um kind of child's voice but very rarely do you find a study in, in this kind of setting, this is industry, it's live in industry. I think we must differentiate between kind of me taking the credit for it because it's not, it's not my intervention. Boeing is very much its own organization. So I'm coming in here as an evaluator. So it's industry-based, it's live in industry, it's actually happening. It's not clinically controlled. Um, where you combine all of the aspects, you follow the journey of a practitioner all the way from pre-training to a year after post-training, and then you speak to the learner. So the, the scope of the study, I think my supervisors are nuts in, in the best polite, polite sense of the word for letting me, <laughs> letting me attempt something like this. Um, but in the sense that it's got so many different methods, it works with so many different people. So it's, it's quantitative to start with, it then make, moves to kind of a mixed method approach where there's qual and quant. It then goes fully quant in the interviews when I speak to um, practitioners. And then it moves into creative research methods where I get kids to draw. So you're kind of going through a full spectrum of, of research processes. 
and I think that's what makes the study unique in the sense that we we are able to follow that practitioner all the way through their journey so you know a thousand practitioners started in this journey with us and then you know we spoke to you know 12 of the students who they work with if that makes sense so it does whittle down in size and I do hope the measures that I've taken to design this project means that it's a representative group so we have tried to sample people who are who are very different from one another to make sure that we're accommodating for a wide workforce but I think that's what makes it unique in the sense that it is so diverse and it is so chaotic and it does make use of so many different methods um, it makes me feel um, a little car sick at times even talking about it because it is such it is such a kind of uh, how would you describe a dramatic journey going from one research approach to another but it does feel authentic not only to me as a researcher which I think is really important it's got to fit well with you and who you are but it fits well with ecological dynamics with boing with kids with chaos you can't be stagnant you can't use the same tool repeatedly so why would you expect a researcher to do the same mm you know, investigate the concept in the way that's best for that concept. And if it's different from the concept you've just used, yes, I know that there's things that you need to account for and you need to be careful and calculated. But if it's authentic to that concept, you must move on and choose the right tool for the job. Otherwise, you're going to miss something. And the last thing you want to do is value the practitioner and miss the child's voice or miss the practitioner completely and only value the child's voice it's got to be both and it's got to be in the same data set it's interesting you know you, you as a re i've not really i've not really um probably appreciated this before but you have to be <laughs> amazingly dexterous as a researcher to be able to use such mixed methods in many ways it mimics how a coach has to act you know you have to have that level of adapt adaptability and dexterity with you know as you react to things going around you so you're taking a very similar approach to your research i could make a fortune if i recorded my supervisory meetings because i've got different <laughs> people from different backgrounds um having different conversations and they tough conversations but they really need to be had because i've got you know qualitative researchers in the room quantitative researchers in the room both with very good humor so i i sit in the middle of this but it, it is true it is there are different tools for the job but we're expecting our coaches and practitioners to do the same i mean we've just spoken you know at length about how dynamic coaches and teachers need to be nowadays to work with a range of students and how boying ecological dynamics constraint led approaches can be another tool in a toolbox so if we're expecting our coaches and teachers to use so many different tools oh, silly to think for me to think as a researcher that i wouldn't have to use so many tools mm. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I've really enjoyed having this conversation with you and uh, 90 minutes has flown by as it often does. Um, I wonder if I can invite some final thoughts from you both, Will? Uh, yeah, thanks for having us on and, and letting us um, sort of talk about the, the research to date and, and have a chance to get out there before anything is, is published. So I think that that's important. And, and this research is you know, largely driven by the want and need to translate some ideas and work with um, coaches and, and practitioners in a real way. So that that's you know, an, another useful thing. I think my final thought is, is almost a, to go back to an offline chat is to have a thought for coaches really that, that actually they're navigating a really complex space and especially post covid and in the context of some sort of really challenging um debate around coaches and the purpose of coaching and, and so on at the moment i think it's useful to to sort of meet them on their journey and i think that's one thing that a sort of a call for action i guess um for lots of people in the space around coach development and and coach education is to think about how we support coaches on the journey because it's a really challenging job, I think, supporting especially young people in, in their development. Um, yeah, so my final thought is that, that you know, that we, we've, we're testing out and thinking about one idea. There are lots out there. 
um, it can be overwhelming for coaches. So I think, you know, that that my thought is to to think about how we might support them on their journey and, and sort of value what coaches and coaching is trying to do with young people. Yeah. Amen to that. Kirsten? Um, maybe more of a personal one um, in the sense that I, I encourage everyone, particularly young practitioners who are working in this field, to listen to the coaches around you because you won't believe the value that comes out of their mouths. And if you listen and you actively listen, you'll be surprised where you end up. So for me, like I said during the podcast, I, I'm not a coach. I don't claim to be a coach. I never started my journey thinking I would end up doing a PhD in coach education um, and knowledge generation and physical literacy. It, it's so far from where I started, but I had some phenomenal coaches around me and I still do. And it's because I listen to them and what they're saying that I find myself here. And I think if we can listen to children in the same way, I can only imagine where, you know, this type of research will end up. It certainly won't necessarily be my research because it's so much bigger um than what we're doing um but i certainly hope it's got people thinking and i encourage people to actively listen to whoever they got around them <laughs> thank you for that it's great um now you have boeing have produced kind of a kind of nice bite size snackable quite uh child childlike way uh report on this and i think that is available for people if they want to get hold of it is that right yes it is it is freely available to anybody who wishes to read it there's also an infographic coming out as well so if you're not somebody who enjoys reading lots of reports there's an infographic and if that um is enough of a teaser then you can go and read the report but it is freely available um and boeing have circulated it um, and I have circulated it. So I encourage you to, to find us on your preferred social media platform. Um, it's For those academics, it's also on the research repository at UOG um, and ResearchGate. So you will be able to find it and I'd be really interested to hear some feedback. Um, and I know, I know Will would as well. And I know Sean Longhurst who helped us write this whole glossy page report up um, would be really interested to see how people have taken it. Yeah, I, I'll put a link in the show notes um, and then people can have a look. Yeah, it'd be great to get their feedback. Hey, listen, uh, both of you, thank you for taking the time to to join me. Um, uh, it's been a great conversation and I'm really looking forward to the continued work of Boeing and what we're going to do and your, res your research and your sort of final PhD coming out, Kirsten, because I think it's going to be really interesting. Thank you so much. Cheers, Joe. Thanks, mate. Thanks for all the support. Uh, hang on a sec. <laughs>